All right, we'll get started. This is two minutes uh, after seven. Thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us. This is uh, my name is Shad Reyes from Detroit America Center, and we are coming to you on third Thursday of every month at 7 p.m. with a one hour CME activity uh, from DMC Medical Group with a series called Heart to Heart. I'm uh, privileged to have my co host, Dr. Kent Zer. He is the um, uh, uh, director of the Cardiovascular Service Line of Detroit America Center, and he is our lead cardiovascular surgeon at Detroit America Center. As you know, this activity is a CME accredited. Uh, at the end of the activity, you'll get a survey evaluating the activity as also giving us some suggestion for future topic that you'd like to hear about or certain speakers. Uh, the survey will be really short, uh, five questions, uh, and then eventually you will be receiving an email with a certificate uh, for the CME hour. All these videos that we are hosting, it's been now a program more a, a little more than a year on monthly basis. All these uh, webinars are, has been hosted on the YouTube channel. I will leave a link at the end of the webinar as well, or I'll post it in the chat box. At any point during this webinar, please make sure you ask questions in the chat box. And uh, I will be, I'll do my our best to address them during the talk or at the end of the presentation. With that, I will start uh, with introducing our speaker is Dr. Zahar Hakim. He is interventional cardiologist at Detroit Medical Center, and uh, he is our uh, partner at Detroit Medical Group, and uh, uh, has been uh, has uh, been doing a lot of uh, experience and work in the venous space. Uh, with that, we'll start with the video, and then we'll jump straight to the presentation. Thank you, Shadi, for inviting me again to this heart-to-heart -heart, uh, webinar. And uh, thank you to all the panelists. Uh, today, our topics will be about uh, contemporary deep venous thrombosis management. We're going to focus on the endovascular management of DVTs. I mean, in the past, we used to treat them just with anticoagulation and then send the patient ho uh, home and hope for the best and hope they're going to recover but this is not the case always. So we're gonna share with you a couple of cases and then we'll show you how we treat them these days in addition to the medical management. So I'll start with the first case. This is a case, this is a 59 year old male with history of hypertension dialysis. He came to the hospital complaining of extreme lower, left lower extremity pain and swelling. He was COVID positive. His uh, venous duplex showed extensive DVT in his uh, left lower extremity. And the uh, uh, clot, the DVT was extending from his left common femoral vein to his tibial vein. I mean, usually uh, the uh, venous duplex cannot see the, well the iliac vein. I mean, sometimes you can go up, you can request uh, in a separate order to uh, uh, screen for the iliac vein, but usually they screen from the com uh, from the common femoral vein all the way down. So if you have a common femoral vein thrombosis, most likely, most likely you, you will have iliac vein uh, clot. So going to this patient, uh, uh, because of the extensive, the extreme pain and extensive thrombosis in his left lower extremity, we took the patient to the lab and we went into his uh, popliteal vein. We get a popliteal vein axis. We perform a venogram. As you can see the venogram, there's clots sitting here in the mid femur, uh, And also you can see the whole femoral uh, vein is full of clots and going all the way up to the uh, common femoral and iliac. We took the IVIS catheter to do an intravascular ultrasound. And then uh, we, found, we went all the way up and then we found a compression in the left common iliac vein, which was, compress, uh, uh, which was compressing and causing stasis and subsequently uh, making clots in his iliac and in his, uh, in his uh, uh, femoral vein. 
all the way down to the tibial vein. So the IVIS showed compression of the left, left common iliac vein, uh, uh, um, showed compression of the left common iliac vein. And so we did some measurement in the uh, common femoral vein too. And as you can see, you can see clots. It's full of clots uh, here in the middle, uh, the common femoral vein. And also the external iliac vein also is full of clots. I mean, below the compression, below the compression of the left common iliac vein, you can see everything was clotted. So first we went with the mechanical thrombectomy device. It's called a clot retriever device. Uh, we, uh, we go all the way up uh, after the clot, we go to the IVC, we open a basket, as you can see with the illustration. We go from the axis of the popliteal vein, we go with over the wire, and then we open the basket, and then we swipe the clot out. We take them out with the basket. And then we can do one single session or we can do multiple session. We're gonna go over, um, sorry for that. This is the sheath. This is the sheath that we introduce. We exchange the sheath in the popliteal vein for this particular sheath that come with the device and it's called the clot river sheath. And this sheath self has a self expanding fennel. So it doesn't uh, allow the clots to come out when you come out and uh, for, to allow the basket to come out. Uh, so we go up, we go after the clot with the, uh, this is the clot river sheath when we introduce it in the body and we open the fennel, it's from nitinol and it's a self-expanding. And then we go with the clot river catheter all the way up after the uh, clot and then we open the basket we open the basket we fully expand it's called a collection bag we open it and we go take out we pull back and we swipe the clot out we try to do multiple session every time we change the angle so the basket, the opening of the basket can face different uh, aspect of the vessel. So in case there is any chronic clot attached to the wall, we can take it out. Then we get out. And then uh, there's also a large bore syringe. We can also uh, suck the clot uh, from the uh, fennel and then we can take this out. This is simply what we did in this part, uh, case and in the other cases too. So this is a clot that we took out from this patient. This all this this is a clot that were in the below the common iliac vein compression, and they were sitting in the external iliac vein and and in the uh, uh, femoral vein. So, so, so I, yes. I just want to pause for a second here. So how do you usually? Are these patients, for example, managed on anticoagulation? And they, they are. So we, start, we start uh, anticoagulation. I mean, uh, if you see improvement, uh, immediate improvement, some, so there, there's no guidelines yet, but some uh, practices, uh, some providers see the improvement with anticoagulation with IV heparin. If the symptoms improve quickly so they, and they feel comfortable, they can uh, continue with the anticoagulation and send patient uh, and follow with the outpatient uh, as outpatient. If you feel patient still symptomatic, complaining of severe pain, the swelling is not improving, you have uh, signs of phlegmaza, and uh, so you need to take the patient and relieve the pressure, the tension. Uh, we'll we'll talk about it in a few slides too. And and post therapy, for example, this case, how did you manage after? After this case, we uh, as usual, uh, we discharge that we switch to oral anticoagulation, and we uh, the the same. Uh, it will be six months, at least six months of oral anticoagulation, because this is like kind of provoked because you had a compression, and we we're gonna you're gonna see in the next slide how we're gonna. Uh, fix the compression with a stent. Uh, so usually I discharge the patient for the stent with an antiplatelet and anticoagulation. So aspirin and, and... Perfect. And Hakeem, can you, uh, Dr. Hakeem, can you get up? Uh, you can get all the way up to the bifurcation 
Or can you even go above it and get out of the IVC? I can go up to the IVC and I can start swipe in the IVC. So also if there's any clot in the IVC, I can take it out on my way. Got it. So post-mechanical thrombectomy, this is how the vein looks like. I mean, you still have some residual. We took it out. We took care of it. Uh, but the, the flow is much better than before, and you have flow all the way up. So for the uh, compression, there was a compression uh, in the common iliac vein, and usually this is the uh, area of the May Turner syndrome. So uh, we, we saw how the vessel, the adjacent uh, artery, was compressing on the left common iliac vein. So uh, you're going to see, and now we uh, determine the size. So we size it and we found and we put we decided to put an 18 times 90 millimeter wall stent uh, for uh, and then we post dilated. So we prefer to put long stents. Uh, we don't want the stent to land in the common iliac vein. We want the stent to land in the external, in the mid to distal external iliac vein. Because if you put the stent and it land in the common iliac vein, it's gonna face the wall. It's going to be perpendicular to the wall. You don't want that. You, you want the uh, stand to be parallel to your vessel. So when we stand all the way down, if, so always try to select a long stand a little bit. Don't select like an 18 times 40 or 18 times 50. No, try to go all 90, go all the way down to the uh, external iliac vein. So uh, after the IVUS, uh, we did some uh, post dilation and we had uh, excellent, as you can see here in the IVUS, we had good results and the stent uh, is well expanded and uh, it uh, fixed the compression uh, in, uh, of the left common iliac vein. So that was the reason. And after we finish, we take the uh, sheath out, the a uh, clot river sheath and we take it out without uh, and we uh, deploy a figure of eight uh, suture and we keep it just for two hours I and mean, it's recommended just one or two hours uh, some in uh, if you have a bigger uh, sheath like uh, like we do in the uh, we do in the pulmonary uh, uh, area when we put a 24 french three four hours it's recommended and for hakim just for the audience if you can go back to the ibis i i, I... I think we have some intervention uh, cardiology fellows just to walk them through what, what they are looking at. You are in the venous system apparently, but uh, yeah, you are in the IVC. Time. We're going all the way down to the. You're looking to the confluence area. You're looking at the landing uh, zone, uh, the stand, how it's landing at the beginning of it. It's well up, up posed, and then we're going all the way down to the common iliac vein. Now we're going to the external iliac vein, and uh, it's well up posed. Uh, also here, uh, and a smooth transition, as you can see, uh, to the uh, uh, distal external iliac vein, and we're going down to the common femoral vein. And uh, sorry to, I hope but we don't go over because of all of our questions, but no problem. Um, You're here to you, talk. When you, when you bring this back, do you catch on the valves then? Uh, you can what happens to those valves? Those valves, it was studied that uh, it's safe. This uh, device is safe on the venous valve. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt them. It was well studied that the function of the valve is preserved and it's very, uh, it's not like traumatic. It doesn't cause any big trauma or any valve dysfunction to these valves, to the venous valve in the femoral vein. I mean, usually the, yeah, you're worried about the valves that is, are in the femoral and uh, in the common femoral vein. Iliac, we have less uh, valve in the iliac veins than the femoral vein, than the lower extremity. Yeah, yeah. My question was the, you know, kind of the big one that's right there before it, it hits the iliac. And I just wonder if it shreds the valve. Not that it's a no. big deal, but it does, it, 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 you can get the clot out and leave the valve functional. They are functional, yes. They stay functional. It was tested like uh, in vivo and uh, they took the clots out and then they inject, they look at the function of the valve and they were working properly. Got it. So this is the, after we took the suture, after four. So this is the area of the May Turner. I mean, it's compressed by the uh, right uh, common iliac artery. Uh, the, and then uh, this is the clots, and we discharge the patient. 
And this Hakeem, is sorry, how yeah. it, if you can uh, illustrate, yeah, I mean, that's a good diagram, but can you illustrate an IVUS? Where is the artery that compressing on the vein? Yes, that's an adjacent. You see how this is the artery? Yeah. If you can go back one more. Yeah, here, yeah, yeah, right here. This is the artery next to it that was compressing parallel to it and it was compressing the vein here, right here. And this is after we, next one, it's not clear, but we fix it and it's on top of it, next to it, adjacent to it. So here. So this stent will prevent future clot and- Future clot, future collapse, yeah. If you take, if you do the thrombectomy without uh, fixing the obstruction or the compression, uh, patient will come back. Even if you put the patient on anticoagulation, uh, patient will come back with uh, clot again. It will not fix it. And sometimes patient present, this May Turner patient can present with just unilateral left lower extremity swelling edema, even without a clot or DVT. Uh, and the treatment for that is to just fix uh, the area of compression with a stent or any intervention. And uh, so the flow can, uh, so you can, uh, the flow can be returned or restored, the venous flow. And here the nice um, uh, diagram, or it's not a diagram, it's like a picture uh, that it demonstrate or illustrate the May Turner syndrome, how uh, the left iliac vein is compressed and uh, by the uh, right iliac artery. And you can see right here how the right iliac artery is compressing. And it's, this compression can cause clot formation below it. And the treatment for that is by placing a stent and uh, so to relieve the compression and, the, and restoring uh, the blood flow or the venous flow back uh, to normal. So May Turner is the compression of the uh, left iliac vein by the right iliac artery. All right. Or sometimes they say, oh, the, the iliac vein is compressed between the two iliacs, the right and the left iliac. So it can be uh, compressed between both of them, like a, it can, uh, can be like a scissor. Mm -hmm. So uh, this case, uh, the case of uh, the first case, uh, it was like a DVT with compression. So you have uh, venous compression causing DVT and how we treated both at the same time. And here we have another case. Uh, uh, Dr. Hakim, before you proceed, yeah. so how did you keep this patient in anticoagulation after the procedure? Yes, uh, anticoagulation, I switched to oral anticoagulation. Uh, I switched to uh, Eliquis or Xorelto. And uh, for six months, uh, because it's, I felt like this is a provoked event by the compression. Yeah. And also I, I do aspirin and Plavix or one, uh, one uh, antiplatelet for one month, at least. Excellent. Dual for one month, then you can keep them for uh, on one antiplatelet if they can tolerate uh, continuously. The next case uh, will be a 62-year-old male with medical history of uh, PE. Patient was on Eliquis. He said he was compliant with his anticoagulation, and he presented with shortness of breath, at rest, and also chest pain. He was... Uh, uh, auto requirement, he needed to be on non rebreather to achieve a good uh, oxygenation. He was hemodynamically stable. The CTPE showed bilateral pulmonary embolism with right heart strain. So usually this is like kind of an intermediate risk uh, pulmonary embolism, or we call it a submassive pulmonary embolism. And this is a CT showing uh, both uh, clots in the right pulmonary artery and in the left uh, pulmonary artery. So this is the main pulmonary artery. It bifurcates into right pulmonary artery. And here at the proximal part here at the mid, you can see uh, the clot. And here too, this is a clot in the left uh, pulmonary artery. So because the patient oxygenation requirement and the right heart strain, so it's a submassive PE. So there is clear data that these patients will benefit from uh, intervention, but we'll talk in uh, other session about uh, PE management, but just showing this case, uh, like this is, we did a PE thrombectomy with a flow retriever catheter, but we're gonna go over it in future session, how we treat that. Uh, after the procedure, we always do venous duplex for these patients to see if there is any DVT that has traveled to his, uh, 
uh, to the pulmonary uh, system and cause uh, PE. And uh, yes, we found a floating clot here. There was a clot in the right femoral vein. Even the vascular tech, she called me, hey, Dr. Hakim, there's a, a floating clot, I think, uh, and uh, she think, uh, we think that this clot can embolize at any time back uh, up to the vein. So it was very loose. So we decided because it was loose, although we can have, uh, it, it was uh, at risk to embolize. So we went in and we suck this patient same way from the popliteal vein. We did a venogram and then we, we can see this clot right here in the middle. This is the floating clot in the middle. I know Dr. Zare, you don't like this. You, 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 you used to bigger clot size sometimes, but this is, this is a clot that was uh, floating in the vein and this was some adjacent clot uh, to it. And some of them has some chronicity. If you can see below, they're not red. When they turn white a little bit, that means they become chronic. We're gonna see more example of that. And this is the IVIS in the femoral vein and it's showing how uh, the clot here uh, in the middle. This was, it was a quick case just to show how impending uh, clot can uh, move quickly to the pulmonary ar uh, um, uh, uh, artery and cause big trouble. They can uh, put a patient at risk for uh, death or uh, cardiac arrest if you have a huge PE, but uh, we took care of both his PE and DVT. Is there, I have a question before we move on. Since this is a topic uh, can be kind of overlapping surgical versus uh, interventional. So how do you see the evolving therapy for PE? Well, you know, that slide that Zahir is showing here is an impressive for the amount of clot retrieval that's a, that you're able to get with your new catheters. Mm -hmm. And if you look at that case, go back one slide on the CT scan. That's a, hard, that's a clot that we have a difficult time getting a good result because it's not saddled across the middle and we don't get, so, so we sometimes have trouble getting that right. And in fact, to get that right, you sometimes have to open the right main pulmonary artery between the aorta and the lung I, and the SVC. You have to go, you have to go there. You can't see it all. You can't see it from the main PA because it goes under the aorta. So if I was being presented with this case and Zahir's on the phone with me, we're having a conference call. I'm going to say, Zahir, do you think you can get this with your catheters? He's going to say yes. And I'm going to say, let's not do this one surgically. So I think that we're that these particular clots where they have a large clot burden, right heart strain, but they're not saddled across the middle, surgeons now are saying, go after it in the cath lab. Whereas if it's still saddled across the middle and we feel like we can pull it all out in one fell swoop from the middle, we'll say, let's take them to the operating room. I agree with you, Dr. Zer. There has been a advancement in the catheter treatment and the vascular treatment of uh, pulmonary embolism and this new catheter, they are 24 French size. So they allow us to suck a bigger uh, chunk of clots and uh, let the patient get better and uh, make good results. Uh, like you can see here also, uh, if you can note the PA pressure, the pulmonary artery pressure before just before the procedure, before the thrombectomy, 49 systolic, diastolic 17, mean PA pressure 31. Immediately on the table, immediately after the thrombectomy, we measured the PA pressure. It went down to 25 systolic, diastolic 12, and mean PA pressure 18. So you have a drop of 13 mean, of a drop in the mean PA pressure of around 13 millimeter mercury. That's yeah, good result. Standard. So uh, any other questions, Shadi, before I move to the third case? No, it's perfect. I just want to have yeah, the perspective no. of surgery. If you have any question, feel free to stop me anytime. Absolutely. So uh, let's let's move. So how do you wrap this case? How, what did you do? Give to the patient? Uh, did you go so, home? Uh, I discharge him on uh, Eliquis, uh, just uh, 10 milligram BID for uh, seven and days. And then uh, uh, I did, no, actually, uh, he, the guy, this guy failed Eliquis. So I discharged him on Xorelto, uh, because he was on Eliquis and despite that he developed. 
and he will need uh, actually a workup uh, for like why he's clotting again and again, why he's resistant to um, anticoagulation. So like, you work with uh, hematology like referral. Hematology referral, they're going to do their workup, uh, why he's resistant, and uh, what, does he have any hypercoagulation state or syndrome or disease? Perfect. So this one, I discharge him on Xeralto. Uh, you do uh, 50 milligram uh, twice a day for 21 days and 20 milligram daily. And, you, and because he felt it's, it's, it's going to be for a long time. I mean, you can decrease the dose if you want later, but I will keep him forever because this is his second time. He keep clotting. Hello, I cannot hear you, Shadi. Yeah, sorry. I, there's a question from the audience. I think it's timely. Uh, do a patient with a chronic DVT or coagulation disorder need to be on lifelong anticoagulation? I mean, uh, yes. I mean, usually this is the practice. I mean, to prevent any uh, acute clot around it, but the anticoagulation will not dissolve any chronic DVT because it turns to collagen. The, the anticoagulation or even a thrombolysis will not dissolve any chronic clot. Chronic clot, it's collagen and it's gonna sit there. But the purpose is to prevent any clot formation around the chronic DVT. Perfect. That's why thrombectomy is very useful and beneficial uh, intervention. So you need a, a mechanical thrombectomy to take this chronic clot out and let the flow restore. I'll get back. Excellent. Yep. Thank We're going to move to the case, uh, third case. And we have a 53 year old male with medical history, also of remote DVT, uh, old DVT, complaint of right lower extremity pain and swelling. Venous duplex also showed extensive thrombosis from uh, a common femoral vein all the way down to his popliteal vein. And you can see here the pictures and they're not compressible. All his veins are not compressible and they have clot. So uh, same, um, uh, we did a venogram uh, we, and we see the clots also the same way, popliteal axis. Uh, patient will be on prone position. Uh, we go from the popliteal vein, we get the ultrasound guided axis, we place an eight French sheath and we take a venogram. You can see how uh, extensive the clots are in. We go with the IVIS catheter and we go all the way up and we see clots sitting in the right external iliac vein. Like I said, the venous duplex report will not tell you if there is any clot sitting in the iliac vein. It does not go, they don't go up and, and screen the iliac vein. So, uh, so, we, so it's the same thing. We uh, went with the mechanical thrombectomy device and uh, with a clot retriever catheter and we took these clots. Those clots were collected from his il uh, external iliac vein and femoral vein. And as you can see, and you're gonna see the improvement you can see the improvement in the flow of his uh, uh, femoral vein. However, I'll show you, there was a residual, uh, there was a residual uh, blockage, or you can see here a stenosis, kind of stenosis in his mid femoral vein. So here, like Dr. Zer, is, uh, Dr. Zer, this is a good case that illustrates there is like a kind of chronic clot sitting in the valve. Here is the site of a valve. So at the valve or between, uh, at the angle of this valve, there was a chronic clot sitting and uh, showing this sign of like, it's kind of a, a stenotic lesion or tight lesion. Despite, despite doing the thrombectomy and taking all the clot out, there was something sitting there maybe, or why it is, was it fibrosis? I don't know, I didn't know yet. So I took a balloon I mean, we took a 14 uh, balloon, we took a 12, then we went up to 14 and we pop up this lesion and we dilate this lesion. We tried to go other, it was a high pressure balloon. And after dilating uh, this lesion, we went with a thrombectomy device again and we took a small piece from there. Uh, we took out a small piece and this is the final result. And you can see, appreciate, this is the site of a valve here, you can see. So it, uh, uh, 
So after that patient felt, be felt better, and the same way he was, the patient was discharged on anticoagulation and uh, follow-up. Any question about the third? How often, how, often, how often do you see these cases where there is... Uh, 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 not often. How often uh, they refer to you, I should say, get referred to you for such therapy, chronic vein, uh, phlegmasia, uh, heaviness yeah. in the leg, yeah. I mean, uh, these days more we are. Uh, we need to do. Uh, we need to do awareness, uh, like uh, DVT, uh, endovascular uh, uh, awareness. That how we can treat this uh, uh, this DVT these days. How we can take them out and we can prevent post thrombotic syndrome, and uh, let the patient recover faster. So uh, still, if you talk, uh, uh, if you talk to referral primary care physician or hospitalist, uh, many of them, they are not aware, but uh, slowly the, we are, I'm showing them the cases, I'm showing them the results, patient, patient telling them that we are feeling much better. So uh, we, we need to do more work on spreading the word and making them aware of the current treatment because this treatment are relatively new. I mean, this catheter has been in the market for the last few years only. A couple of years ago, 10 years ago, if you want to do an intervention, you, we used to do thrombolytic catheters. We, need, we used to uh, drip uh, alteplase or, thromb uh, or uh, thrombolysis in the vein for uh, the whole night, for 12 to 24 hours. So it depends how fast you want to go. And then there were, there were complications with uh, such procedure, like bleeding, even with local uh, thrombolysis. There were bleeding patient, and you need ICU. You need to put the patient in ICU. So it was not common. Sometimes they used to use it. There was also Angiojet has been in the market for many years, for the last 20 years, but also it was not used. But right now you see this immediate result with this catheter. You take the clots out and you see the results in front of you. Patient feels better after a few hours. He, the, the, the pressure is, is, uh, he, is released. And patient uh, feels better, can get up, can walk immediately. It's uh, this this treatment is relatively new, so we need to spread the word. We need to uh, have program. That's why we we are in a process of uh, doing like a PERT program, and also maybe in the future to do a DVT program and to get more referral and to help this patient be treated well. Hakim, another question on the same topic. Would DVT thrombectomy be an alternative to anticoagulation in patients with high-risk bleeding? Uh, uh, yes, I mean, it can help uh, restore the flow. And if you have, uh, for example, also if you have a lot of DVT or a patient has contraindication to uh, anticoagulation uh, temporarily for different reasons, you can place an IVC filter after that and uh, to prevent any future clot from uh, traveling to the pulmonary arteries and causing a PE. But, uh, but we need to make sure and these patients follow up the one the patients that we place an IVC filter because these uh, filters are also thrombogenic. If they sit for a long time, it, it will be very difficult to take them out after a few months. So we need to uh, we place them usually temporarily for a few weeks, and we take them out after that, after the uh, reason for uh, the contraindication uh, of uh, anticoagulation is resolved. Other question. Like, for example, if a patient with hemorrhagic stroke, subarachnoid hemorrhage, or any uh, reason that can prevent you from um, uh, bleed, uh, from placing the patient on contra uh, contra uh, anticoagulation. I can share with you a couple of cases like um, a patient with um, uh, uterine um, bleeding uh, from fibroids. Uh, like uh, the uh, females, like you put them on anticoagulation uh, and then they bleed. They have uterus bleeding. They have uh, fibroids. They have uh, masses. So I usually uh, call, the, uh, I involve uh, multiple time. I get uh, gynecology involved and I ask them to help me uh, and they, to fix the bleeding so I can put the patient on anticoagulation. 
So one case, uh, we ended up doing a hysterectomy, a gynecology, a patient needed a hysterectomy. So instead of following up as outpatient and uh, get, be, uh, putting the patient at risk of bleeding for a few months or ending not having, I called the gynecology and he took the patient the same admission after the next day for hysterectomy. And I was able to start anticoagulation immediately after that. Another patient, I involved gynecology too for uh, th uh, same bleeding and what they did, hysteroscopy, and also a kind of ablation from inside. And then they place an intrauterine device to prevent the bleeding. And I was able also to start anticoagulation. Question so about always, that. always try to fix the bleeding if you can fix. If you cannot fix it, uh, you can uh, like do the thrombectomy, place an IVC filter. And when the uh, contraindication is resolved, uh, you can place the patient back on anticoagulation. A question about the blood loss. How much the blood loss expected on average from this procedure? PE. On this pr the procedure, no, it's not like PE. Uh, minimal uh, because you usually collect uh, the clots in the bag and you take them out, so no blood loss at all from these cases. Like minimal, like you can say twenty to thirty cc blood uh, loss. Uh, uh, PE you can see up from. 400 cc to uh, one liter, but now we have a new device called a uh, flow saver that can save the blood and we can give the blood back to the patient. We'll talk about it next month in a dedicated uh, PE session. Perfect, thank you. I'm gonna move to the next uh, case, case number four. We have a 47 year old female uh, with medical history of breast cancer and liver hemangioma. She recently uh, got uh, embolization by IR and followed by DVT thrombectomy of right iliac vein by IR. One week later, uh, it was according to them, it was very successful and the patient felt better. She was discharged and she was uh, discharged on anticoagulation, <coughs> eliquis, and patient was uh, compliant with her eliquis. One week later, patient returned to the ER complaining of severe right lower extremity edema and pain. You can see, this is her picture. You can see her right leg, it's almost double the size of her left leg. Look how big from her thigh, uh, from her hip all the way down. Even you can see how shiny becomes because of the tension, uh, how sh the skin becomes shiny, full of uh, tension, fluids. You can see the, the, the pressure. So uh, because of the severe pain and she has DVT before, we decided to go up again, to go in again. So we uh, went also from her right popliteal vein. We placed her eight French sheath and we injected. The first picture we can see, this is a venogram. Her left, it was only one week. Her left uh, femoral vein is open. Then our, all the way up, we start to see, we start to see blockage of her left, oh, sorry, for her, of her right external iliac vein. Sorry, the, the image is flipped. So the left external iliac vein is occluded and you can see some collateral starting to form uh, around uh, the, before the blockage. So here you can uh, see better uh, the blockage and how collateral are forming, trying to form and to bypass the blocked area. So uh, same way we took, uh, we went with a thrombectomy device, a clot retriever device, a catheter, and we opened the bag above uh, uh, after the iliac vein, uh, and we uh, we took out all the clots. We collect this is like in one week collected because she had a thrombectomy last week, so it's small amount of clot uh, collected in a four by four gauze. Uh, but this is what was causing her blockage. But there was a problem. Why she blocked again? Also, her vein were compressed. So this is a clot river catheter. Like we said, this is a sheath and it uh, has a fennel. And the catheter has a bag, collection bag, and has coring element. And this is called the clot river catheter. Uh, so after that, we did the balloon and uh, venoplasty, uh, balloon venoplasty of the right common iliac vein and external iliac vein. 
So there definitely was com compressed this vein. So she had the vein compression. That's what she's developing the clots below. And so we place a stent, wall stent in her in the common iliac vein and external iliac vein, also along as you can see. And because the blockage, if you get the blockage was around here, so we ended up uh, landing at um, around the common uh, the femoral head. And it's totally okay. I mean, studies have shown that it's okay. There's no risk of the stent uh, to bend or to squeeze uh, close to the femoral head. Uh, so we, uh, we needed to land here. So we went all the way down and this is the clots and this is her follow-up visit with us in the clinic and we discharged the patient on same anticoagulation because I didn't feel she fail uh, eloquence. I felt like she, this patient has a compression of her vein and she needed to stand from the beginning. So uh, after placing the stand, we discharged her on, uh, on eloquence and also antiplatelet therapy. And patient just follow up in the clinic uh, and she's feeling much better. She's feeling happy. Her right lower extremity is normal in size, as you can see. Uh, it's almost identical to her left leg. So, Dr. Uh, Hakim, again here, um, when do you think the need for stenting in these cases? Yes. So, usually IVIS. IVIS will tell you the, if you need to stent or, uh, or not. If you see compression, like vein compressed by anything, like sometimes you can have external uh, organs or external uh, Anything can press the vein from externally, like, like I said, um, a fibroid mass, a uh, mass in the ovarian, a lymph node, enlarged lymph node. One time there was a patient with an enlarged lymph node compressing on the, uh, on the iliac veins. So it was causing compression syndrome, I mean, compression disease. And then uh, you need to stand. So the IVIS will show you if there is any compressed area, uh, more than uh, around 70% by IVIS. So yes, you need to stand it to relieve uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, compression and to make the flow better and to prevent any uh, uh, clot formation by the compression. So usually by IVIS, some old school, old school, because they don't use IVIS before the IVIS, they used to rely on venogram, which is a little bit difficult. And usually the venogram, you need to have good filling pressure. You need to make sure you have the filling pressure of your vein. And also it's judging by your eyes, but it's been some old school do by venogram, but I don't recommend to do it by venogram. I recommend doing it by IVIS to get all the measurement from the IVC all the way down to the iliacs and to the femoral and get the measurement. And if there is any area compressed, you need to stent it. If the, and you need to make sure the filling pressure patient is well hydrated and also the filling pressure is good. Some uh, um, interventionalists, uh, they check the RA pressure to make sure and make sure it's uh, 10 and above, uh, 5 to 10, to make sure the patient is well hydrated. So, and some uh, people give just a bolus uh, of fluids before the procedure to open well the vein. So, they avoid any uh, pseudo uh, compression or pseudo stenosis uh, in the iliac vein. So the answer to your question, Ivis will tell you if you need to uh, stand or not. If you yeah. have any real compression, uh, like if you have a May Turner, compression by iliac arteries, by any organ external uh, compression, by any fibrosis, anything compressing, Ivis will tell you. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Any question? I see someone has maybe a question. Up before. I think this question kind of overlapped. My question was yeah. overlapping with his about when to stent for uh, versus keep uh, try give him a trial of anticoagulation. But I think you answered by using IVIS and imaging. IVIS and imaging, yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to talk quickly about uh, DVT. Do we have time, Shadi, to talk about uh, some uh, DVT? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have uh, uh, ten minutes. Yeah. Yeah. 
So as you, uh, we're gonna uh, over, go over uh, DVT, uh, blood clots uh, they are, uh, that can form the deep venous system in the legs and pelvis. So 50% of the DVTs can develop post-thrombotic syndrome. And post-thrombotic syndrome is a chronic lifestyle limiting disease. And it comprises of swelling, pressure, and chronic pain and ulcers. And nearly 90% of post-thrombotic uh, syndrome patients cannot work in 10 years after diagnosis. So it can have very bad uh, consequently. I mean, this uh, uh, post-thrombotic syndrome. Um, pain when patients stand up, he can tell you at the end of the day, I have pain, I have ulcers. I stand up all day, I have pain, numbness, redness. My leg is warm. You can have different, uh, all the symptoms. Patient can report all the symptoms. All right. So uh, what's the goal of DVT intervention? Our goal is to reduce this uh, physiological goal to reduce the swelling, to restore the venous flow, to remove the thrombus, because we're going to talk about the visual venous obstruction concept and how uh, the outcome of it, and to address the underlying compression, why the patient developed DVT always, what's the etiology? Why he developed DVT? Is it is there a mechanical obstruction or is just like a uh, patient has uh, like hypercoagulation? What's the reason he's developed DVT? We, we, we need to address it. We need to figure out not only just prescribe oral anticoagulation and discharge the patient home. Clinical outcome, we need to improve mortality by reducing the risk of PE, improve the quality of life by preventing post-thrombotic syndrome. We will improve the quality of life patient. Patient will feel better, will be discharged faster, will go back home uh, and will go back to work faster. Speed recovery, also reduce adverse outcome like we talk about them. The post-thrombotic recurrence of PE, DVT and the phlegmasia. Also, uh, we have a scoring system. The Wells score uh, is a clinically uh, a score to uh, risk stratify patient to predict if patient has DVT or not. And based on the score, uh, we can either start anticoagulation and you can obtain uh, what the likelihood of the patient have DVT. And uh, remember, we, especially for the resident, I mean, it's uh, very useful when you admit this patient to know if this patient to just guide you, should you look for DVT or not. And this, if a patient has a um, uh, score more than three, DVT is likely, but must be confirmed via ultrasound. You cannot make sure. So this is the scores, active cancer, uh, you get one score, paralysis, so active cancer. Um, uh, paralysis uh, patient, you have a lot of bedbound patients coming from nursing home, so this uh, can get another score. Recently bedridden for more than three days, or major surgery within the previous 12 weeks requiring general or regional anesthesia. Localized tenderness, especially in the calf area. Entire leg swelling. Calf swelling at least three centimeters larger than that on the asymptomatic side. Pitting edema, collateral superficial veins, but non-vicose, previously DVT, like you saw, most of our patients, they will tell you, oh, history of previous DVT and uh, OPE. Or we had two patients, two patients from the cases. They had previous DVT. They were, they were. Most of them were on anticoagulation. Three of them actually. Uh, alternative diagnosis. If you have, you, you this is minus score. If you have an, any alternative diagnosis, like heart failure. If you have heart failure, patient was coming with bilateral lower extremity edema. I mean, you have a diagnosis already. So don't think about DVT, but you can keep it in mind. They can come together. All right. So we have also another score, VLATA score for post-thrombotic syndrome. So here you have a, a score more than 15 is a severe disease. Five to nine is mild. You have disease, but it's mild PTS and uh, 10 to 14 moderate disease. So you have symptoms and you have clinical signs and then you get score for each one. And it each uh, symptoms, has if it's absent and one uh, if it's mild symptoms one 
moderate get a two score, severe get a, a, a three score, and then you uh, combine them. If the patient's Villata score is five to 14, that means uh, mild to moderate uh, post thrombotic syndrome, more than 15, or pressure uh, or presence of ulcer. If you have ulcers, more than 15, or presence of ulcer, it is a severe PTS or post thrombotic syndrome. So there's another classification useful for the venous disease. Also, we have as a, um, this uh, classification, the uh, clinical etiology, anatomy, pathophysiology classification system. Also, you go by the signs, and uh, also it is helpful to classify these patients. So Doppler is a gold standard for this uh, DVT. Uh, it's cheap, it's available, and uh, it depends on the compressibility of the veins. And also D-dimer, you can uh, also uh, order a D-dimer if you are in doubt, like, uh, and you're waiting, you can order a D-dimer, it's very helpful. But it has a lot of uh, false positivity. And can uh, D-dimer, me remember, especially for uh, D-dimer can be elevated in any condition where clotting may be involved, like cancer, recent surgery, or sepsis. So it does not confirm the diagnosis of DVT. It's just make, uh, it can rule it out quickly if it's negative. So if positive world score and positive D-dimer Doppler is needed to confirm DVT. You can also do CT scan and MRV, but they are expensive. Also venography, you can go. Sometimes we go with venography and IFRS. And this is example of CT scan showing extensive DVT in the left uh, uh, iliac vein, extending from the IVC all the way down to the left uh, system. Why to treat DVT with intervention? Why not only with oral anticoagulation? Like I said, early restoration of vein patency. And to also to, pre to preserve valvular function. Like back to your question. If the intervention will preserve, uh, can, if the intervention will preserve or protect or help uh, my uh, valve or will damage them. No, actually it will help them because uh, the, the more clot you have around the valve, like you can see here, the more clot you, dev uh, you developed around the valve and the more chronicity and the inflammation around this valve, it can cause damage to this valve and this valve will not be uh, functional the valve becomes leaky and allowing fluid. And you have this patient, despite what you're doing, uh, you have a chronic swelling, a chronic edema. We see these patients all the time. You have leg pain, whatever you do, whatever intervention in the future. And also to prevent pulmonary embolism. That's why when I want to take it, like the case, I show you the, cl uh, the floating clot in the midfemoral vein. Also to uh, prevent uh, recurrent DVT by uh, taking all this chronic clot and to prevent post-thrombotic syndrome. And you can see after the survival rate after uh, and uh, recurrent DVT after two years and uh, uh, eight, uh, eight years. So if you leave clot behind, what will happen? Residual venous obstruction, like I said, it's all in one cycle death by PE, you increase the risk of PE, patient can die. Recurrent DVT, you may have post thrombotic syndrome, then a uh, big uh, low, uh, limb problem. And then uh, post thrombotic syndrome, it will be severe, very painful, prevent patient from walking, patient will be disabled, will apply for disability. Also stent failure, if you, if you stent, if you don't take the clot out, if you don't do the thrombectomy out uh, first, and then you stent, you have a higher risk of venous stent failure. And the single most powerful predictor of venous stent failure is residual, residual thrombus. So if you leave any clot behind, you are, at, you are at risk of venous stent failure. Even if you, so even if you fix a compression problem, if you leave any clot, behind, you put yourself at risk of uh, stent thrombosis and stent failure. With visual venous uh, obstruction, we talk about it and the same, but this is all the data, all the study from 2002 till uh, now, and it's showing all the data about uh, the residual venous obstruction and uh, the independent predictor of death as a uh, common and even independent predictor of death recurrent VTE 
and post thrombotic syndrome and venous stent failure. What device available in the market? Like I said, AngioJet has been available for many years and it goes, uh, it's eight, uh, three French to eight French. It's not a big uh, catheter and uh, it can remove the acute soft clot, but it cannot remove the uh, older clot. So it, it, it make a wash inside the, it's a catheter connected to a big device and it make like a wash out inside the vein. Um, and you need to go a frequent time. So it's, it cannot be done single session. You need to do it frequent time, uh, but it does not take big clots. It's just try to dissolve the soft clot with heparin and then suck it out uh, and wash it by suction. Penumbra, Penumbra is another device has been in the market for the last couple of years too. And it recently they upgraded their catheter to twin French and they have a lighting system. And also it's rotational and uh, it's connected to a, a, a canister and it does a suction. Uh, but also it's 12 French. I mean, sometimes in the big veins like the iliac veins or the IVC, we may need a bigger catheter. So this uh, catheter is very good uh, usually for the arterial thrombosis or the, uh, the uh, clot in the uh, femoral vein or lower. It will be very useful. But in the upper, it may not be very useful. We may need like bigger catheter uh, in the future. We have also the um, catheter directed thrombolytics, ECOS. I mean, everybody knows ECOS, ECOS. Can you evaluate him for ECOS? ECOS is just local thrombolysis. It's a catheter and you give the thrombolytics, you give a TPA and it has some ultrasound uh, effect to break uh, the clots. Uh, it has like a high, uh, it was a very high frequency uh, uh, waves to break the clot. I mean, that's the uh, advertisement of the company. Uh, but however, you need to, it, it, it needs uh, to stay in ICU. It has also bleeding risk and, uh, and you, uh, it needs a couple of hours uh, to treat, like 12 to 24 hours. Uh, other catheter available in the market, a new one that was, uh, will come up uh, to the market is called Quick Clear from Philips. It's also, it's like Penumbra, but without the canister. It connects to this aspiration pump, the small, you can see it here, and it's connected to a bag, cheap bag, and you suck. Also a 10 French catheter, also has a curve and it's rotational in the system. We have another one, Vitex medical revenue from Bectomy catheter from another company, also 10 French catheter, and it's very useful to wall adherent clot and another uh, system for rot rotational thrombectomy, the cleaner, we use it for the dialysis access thrombectomy. So this is a clot. Uh, as you can see, the red clots are fresh, like acute. Look at the color of the clot. They are red, fresh, you can see. More chronic, we're going, look how they turn to white color, like almost white. This is called lagine. So collagen will not be dissolved by any thrombolysis or any anticoagulation. Like this clots will, even if you keep the patient forever on anticoagulation, this clots will not dissolve. That's why thrombectomy is very important to restore the venous flow and to prevent uh, uh, acute and chronic clot or DVT. Clot Trever, this is a system that I use, uh, one of the thrombectomy device, and I want to talk to you about. It's a big basket and it's very useful. And I show you the video. We're not going to repeat it. We saw, we saw it. So um, it's designed to remove all the clots uh, from the vessel wall. It's a big basket. It expands in the IVC and we can all go all the way down and it can accommodate the venous uh, wall and venous size. But, uh, uh, one more minute, if you don't mind. Yes, to I will time. wrap up in one minute. And this is the clot river sheath and catheter. And this is a product uh, view. We go over it. And this is the clots. As you can see, uh, the DVT thrombus is 28%. Uh, the known fibrin content was more than 70% on all the clots that we removed. So that means uh, the anticoagulation cannot work on this 72% uh, uh, um, uh, material of the clot. It can work only on the fibrin, the 28%. Uh, even in PE, so it's proven in both DVT and PE, uh, the non-fibrin uh, uh, material is the majority of the clot. So it's safe, it's very safe, like we saw, this device, no complication, it's safe, it's proven, it can preserve the valve, 
and can remove a lot of clot and the safety has been, and here they, uh, the patency and valve function restored. So before the case, this is a picture after the case and also follow up, you can see how the valve, you can look here, you can see that the valves are working and preserve the function of the valve. Okay, the cloud, this is the registry uh, to collect all the cases and to prove efficacy and uh, to achieve the outcome and it's data or we can go over it uh, again. And this is a uh, lytic free single session. It's bloodless thrombectomy, so no blood loss. So usually it's 99% uh, uh, like single session. That means we don't need to do uh, multiple days. That's from one time we do all this, but we can go multiple time. The esti median estimated blood loss was 50 cc and uh, we never, uh, they didn't use uh, uh, any thrombolysis. And the uh, safety was uh, approved. Uh, no valve damage, 0%, no acute renal injury and no devi uh, device related side effects was 0.4%. Um, and this uh, life without clot, a uh, six month outcome, normal flow via duplex ultrasound, 89%, uh, freedom from moderate or severe PTS by Vilata score, 92%, and 100% reduction in pain. And thank you very much uh, for uh, listening and for attending this webinar heart to heart. And I hope to see you soon again for another session. Thank you, Dr. Hakim, for your time. Really, it's a great informative uh, information about management of DVT. Dr. Zer, any final comments? Uh, you know, I, I think this is exciting new technology for very difficult problems. And we all see these patients, and it's exciting to have new therapies that are available. In the words of my old professor from London, Sir Magdi Yakub, he always used to say, recreate the anatomy. And I think that this is a beautiful thing for recreating flow, particularly in the common iliac veins, because those are the patients that are severely symptomatic. And if you can get them open back up and get them get long-term patency, you've done a world of good for a lot of patients. And the most, the most important case that you showed was that lady that had her leg was twice as big on the one side and several weeks after therapy, she's back to normal. That's a grateful patient and that's a, great, that's a great therapy for that patient. So I think we ought to keep our minds open. I think this is exciting technology. And as new technology comes along, we're even gonna see better results. Thank you, yeah, it's, uh, the field is evolving. Many devices coming to the market and we still need to do more studies and to collect more data and to show outcome and safety. Absolutely. Well, I would like to thank you again, Dr. Hakim, for your time, please. Uh, and thank our audience for sticking around. We have uh, a little bit more than 25 uh, attendees on the call. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this webinar comes to you every, every fourth Thursday of the month uh, at 7 p.m. Uh, we're going to have uh, a series again this year. It's a CME accredited, and uh, we're going to everybody who registered, you're going to get an email uh, later tonight or tomorrow for a quick survey. Once you complete it, you submit it, uh, you're going to receive a, a CME certificate um, in the email. Uh, thanks for Elise Bennett and Sherry Alvaro for helping us with putting this webinar together from uh, DMC Medical Group. And again, watch this video and others on YouTube channel at DMC Medical Group YouTube. Uh, we're gonna share the link again with the group uh, once we have a more collection. Again, this is a more than a year work of webinars. Um, and again, any uh, cardiac needs, please do feel free to reach the number 888-542-7028. And again, if you have any urgent transfer for any ECMO or transfer for any urgent cardiac need, this is the number for transfer center. Again, this is a CME activity. Uh, I would like to thank my co-moderator, Dr. Zer, for your time, as well as for helping us putting this program together. And uh, I wish everybody a good night. Thank you, Shadi. Thank you, everyone. Good night, everybody. Thank you for all attendance. I hope you have enjoyed this DMC Medica Group video. To find more content, webinars, and physician videos, visit dmcmedicalgroup.com.